All right, so chapter 5 has been dealing with salvation. And the first couple of chapters we dealt with, I'm just going to give a little review because Betty and Ray, you've been out. And, and uh, John, I don't think, was here for the first few chapters. But first few chapters of Roman lays out a very good case on why we need a Savior. And the first two chapters told us that Regardless of how you look at the human race, whether you look at it from a historical standpoint or a religious standpoint or a moral standpoint, we're hosed, right? The human race is just terrible. We're just a bunch of sinners. Everywhere you look, all you see is corruption and, and um, sin. And, and that's why God lays out the case that, hey, there's none righteous. Nobody, not one, measures up to God's standards. But the wonderful truth is, in chapters 3 and 4, God lays out the plan for man because God is not willing that any should perish, right? That's what he's told us. And so he laid out how he went about to bring us into a position where we can be righteous with God, that we can be accepted by God, that we can be in his presence for eternity. And that is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, he provided a salvation. He provided a righteousness to us. He provided a way that we might have all our sins forgiven and be given a righteousness that we didn't deserve and can't earn, but is sufficient for God to accept us in his presence. And that term is called justification. He justifies us. He makes it as if we had never sinned in his presence. What a wonderful gift. And the Bible tells us in chapter 4 that that's a free gift. 3 and 4 of Romans tells us it's free. It's by His grace. We have to simply reach out and accept it. Now, what is faith? Faith is simply believing that God will do what He said He'll do. And what He said He will do is if we trust Christ as our Savior, He'll forgive our sins and give us a righteousness that is sufficient for us to stand in His presence for eternity. What a wonderful gift. And then in chapter 5, Paul summed up how we got in this weird situation where we are simply all a bunch of sinners. It's because of Adam. When he sinned, he plunged the entire human race into sin. And we now, because we have the nature and a curse that Adam brought into the world, we are sinners. But God started a brand new family line. Jesus Christ is our new Adam. And because he, through his obedience, opened the door for us to have a relationship with God, we, by being born again, can enter into a new family. We don't have to stay in the family of Adam, which leads to sin and death. We can now be born again into a new family, a family headed by Jesus Christ. And that family is life and righteousness and eternity in heaven with God. So what a wonderful thing. Paul has laid out the entire case for salvation in the first five chapters of Romans. But today we get into a brand new section. In chapter 6, we've been talking about how we get saved from sin. But in the next few chapters, Paul's going to tell us how we're to live for God. Because in the minds of many, many people, and I don't know if you were ever one of these people or even if you're one of these people today. It kind of goes something like this. Okay, I trusted Christ as my Savior through faith. I believe that God would save me and I said yes to God and I've been born again and I know I'm a child of God and now I have to try really, 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 really hard to do all the things that God told me to do in the strength of my own will. I've got to just hunker down and break all those bad habits and change all my old ways and I'm going to live for God and so I set up a lot of rules that I'm going to live by. <laughs> What's that? Good luck with that. <laughs> Good luck with that, Judy says. That's exactly what Paul said. Good luck with that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's a lot of the people that live that way. So they have these rules. I'll go to church. I'll pray. I'll do this. I'll stop doing that. I won't hang out with these people. I'll do all of these things. And they do it all in the power of their own strength. Kind of like, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Dumbo, Disney movie, with a little train. 
He's going up the hill. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. He's trying real hard to go up this really steep hill. Well, that's kind of the way a lot of Christians live their lives, and they end up feeling exactly the same way. It's just so hard to live for God and do all the right things. And, you know, and some people actually give up. They give up trying because they know they can't do it. Well, Paul's going to tell us in the next few chapters that that's not what Christian living is all about at all. Because what God requires from us to live righteously before God it's one thing to be righteous in standing before God, but God has another expectation of us, doesn't he? He expects us to live for him. But just like we received Christ by faith and we live in his presence by faith, he also expects us to walk by faith. Every day we walk by faith. And that's a whole different way of living than trying just to keep a bunch of rules. So Paul's going to get into this. We're going to kind of take our time through this section, primarily because it's so important. When we get saved, yeah, someday I'm going to stand in the presence of God, isn't he? All right, someday. And someday I'm going to be righteous, and I'm going to be with the angels, and I'm going to know I'm standing righteous before God someday. Someday I'm going to walk the streets of gold. Someday I'm going to have a mansion in the sky. Someday, someday, someday. And all that is real for us someday. What about today? What about tomorrow? That's where we live, right? That's where we need to have the power of God in our life every day. And so we can expect victory every day, not just when I die and I stand in the presence of God. It's kind of like the prayer that I, one person said. He got up and he said, Dear Lord, so far today, I'm doing all right. I'm not gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I've not whined, complained, cursed, eaten any chocolate, or changed or charged anything on my credit card. I'm doing really good today. But Lord, I'll be getting out of bed in a minute, and I think I'll really need your help then. <laughs> right? That's kind of like where are we at. Do you ever experience this problem? Now, Paul's going to outline some real problems. And Judy commented on this when she said, well, good luck with that, right? Trying to live for God in the power of your own strength. Paul tried to do that, as a matter of fact. The Apostle Paul gives us an experience later on in these next few chapters where he tried to struggle with living for God. So Paul was a Pharisee. His name was Saul. What was a Pharisee? What is a Pharisee? Stan said Paul was a Pharisee before he became a Christian and, and uh, met Jesus. What's a Pharisee? A Jewish zealot. A Jewish zealot. Okay. So Paul was Jewish and he was a zealot. What I was asking is that, is that an endeavor you can earn a living at? Does Pharisee? Being, does being a Pharisee pay money? <laughs> does. Well, you know, Jesus said that it did because he said, you guys are just a bunch of greedy rats. So apparently it was a really good living. But a Pharisee was a religious Jewish zealot. Okay. He was a rabbi. The Pharisees were a group of Jewish spiritual leaders who were meticulous about keeping the law. It was all about following the rules. You couldn't deviate from the rules. And God laid down some rules, didn't he? I mean, yeah. he they had some rules. What are some? God's rules. What's that? They had rules beyond God's rules. They had rules beyond God's rules. God laid down some rules, Ten Commandments, the Old Testament law, the, course, the, 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 the uh, dietary laws that God laid down. All of the laws in the Old Testament were things that, that the Jews were supposed to follow, but the Pharisees went way beyond that. You couldn't work on the Sabbath. They had a rule that you couldn't wear false teeth, because if you happen to drop your false teeth and pick them up, that would be working. You couldn't do that. <laughs> you know, if you had, if you had, um, if you spit on the ground, you couldn't kick the dirt on the spit, because that would be working. That would be tilling the ground. They had all these weird, weird tight, couldn't wear a wooden leg, because that's working. And all kinds of strange laws. What were they trying to do with all these laws? Why would they do that? 
Why would the Pharisees have such a strict adherence to not only God's laws, but all the other laws? Control. Control? Okay. Well, they wanted to control people, but what about for themselves? They really went about keeping it. Okay, so it might have been a pride thing. You know, hey, look at me. I keep all the laws and then the 5,000 other laws that everybody else says we're supposed to keep. So they never did, but they never did. pretended to. So they were basically police officers. They were the spiritual police officers for the nation. That's a good way to put it. They made sure everybody did what was right. When Jesus was walking through the field with his disciples and they pulled grains from the wheat and ate them, who are the ones out there pointing their finger at him saying, you can't do that. That's working on the Sabbath. It was the Pharisees. Yeah, they, they were, were doing work. Awesome. Yeah. What? what? It was like that. It was doing work. Yeah, that's work. <laughs> that's work. Um, so they were the ones out there telling everybody how to do it right. And they were doing it, trying to do it themselves because they were earning their way to heaven. They were trying to earn God's favor. And that is the problem we talked about at the beginning. A lot of people try to earn God's favor. I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I've got to do the other thing, or God's not going to be happy with me. God's not going to like me. God's going to be mad at me if I don't do X, Y, Z. And so he lived by all these rules, and the Pharisees were really good at living by the rules. The problem is, and Paul faced this problem as well, is that no matter how hard you try, you're going to find that you can't do it. You can't live by God's rules, and you can't even live by the own, your own rules because we're just not strong enough to do it perfectly. So people that are trying to earn their way to heaven, trying to do all the right things, if they're honest with themselves, they'll realize they're not measuring up. Paul had that problem. Listen to what Paul said and some of the things in, um, he said in Romans chapter 7, which we're going to get to next time. Paul said, I do, not I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what, the, what I hate are the things that I actually do. Paul found this struggle in himself. Maybe you've experienced this struggle yourself. You know the right thing to do, but you end up doing the wrong thing. You know the bad things you're not supposed to do, but you end up doing them. That's kind of a dilemma, don't you think? I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Some people get very down on themselves because they don't live up to the standards they've set for themselves and they don't live up to the standards that God has set for them. Sometimes they end up being very, very angry with themselves and bitter with themselves, kicking themselves for not doing the right thing. For what I do, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, I'm not going to ask you for a raise of hands, but how many have a habit that you simply can't seem to get rid of and you know you shouldn't be doing it? Now, maybe it's not every day. Maybe it's not every month. But there's just something that you don't think you should be doing, but doggone it, I can't stop doing it. And I fall into that temptation and trap. Paul had that problem too. Now if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Paul's not saying I'm not, Paul's not saying, hey, I'm not responsible for my sin. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, I am responsible for my sin, but I can't stop sinning. Even though I'm a Christian, even though I've been saved and born again, even though I have the Spirit of God living within me and I've got all these wonderful promises that God has given to me, I can't seem to get it together every day. I can go for a while and do pretty good, but then all of a sudden, bam, I'm back down off the wagon and then I've got to start all over again, confessing my sin and feeling bad and 
kicking myself or doing stupid. <laughs> Ever experienced this problem? <laughs> and it's not just me. <laughs> I think we all have this problem. I hope you can relate. If you can't relate to it, then you're lying to yourself. Paul had that problem, and he was a Pharisee before he got saved, trying to work his way to heaven. After he got saved, he tried to do just that. He got saved, went out, said, I'm going to just tear it up for God. I'm going to follow all the rules. I'm going to do the right thing. And he just went and fell right back into the same place he was before he got saved. In terms of living daily for God. So what's the problem? Remember last week, um, I put this diagram on the board. You had Adam. And he had a unfortunate um, interaction with a fruit <laughs> and plunged the rays into sin, right? Through this one act of disobedience right here in the Garden of Eden. The whole race of humans is now into sin. However, Jesus, through his one act of obedience on the cross, started a whole new family. Remember this from last week? Family of righteousness. The problem is... And if you're born again, that's not the problem, by the way. <laughs> this is a caveat. When you're born again, just like you were born into the family of Adam that created sin, when you're born again, you're born into the family of Christ, which provides you righteous standing before God. The problem is, does this go away just because you got saved? Are you still human? Are you still flesh and blood? Are you still a son and daughter of Adam? Absolutely you are. So this here is still a problem. Is that a finger? I see a finger back there. Yes, we found a butt. <laughs> we also received something when we were born. Again. We haven't got there yet. I know. We're <laughs> She's jumping ahead. So I know, but we're, we're setting the stage. I'm taking it slow because this is important. So we still have this old nature, right? Now look at some terms that I put on the board that describes who we were before we got saved and what still remains in us after we're saved, after we're born again. You don't become, you are a new creature in Christ when you get saved. But that doesn't mean this old stuff just disappears. It doesn't. What do all these Bible terms have in common? Now, I put them up on the board here. The flesh, Romans 7, 5. That's where you find this term. The carnal man, Romans 8, 7. Body of sin, Romans 6, 6. Old man, Colossians 3.9, Ephesians 4.22. The old nature, Ephesians 2.8. The natural man, 1 Corinthians 2.14. What do you think all of those terms have in common? There's one common thing. What's that? Sin? Okay. All of these have in common sin. All of these terms describe what resides in us because we're human. These are all terms that describes our sinful propitiency. That's not the right word. Uh, our, our sinful desires. Propensity. Propensity. There you go. <laughs> propensity. All of these describes our propensity to sin. This is what Paul's describing when he said, ah, oh, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. He's talking about the flesh, the carnal man, the body of sin. This old nature that we have that causes us to do. Did you notice most of those are man? Oh, <laughs> 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 good one. <laughs> 
Except this one. <laughs> well, old nature doesn't have it either, yeah. That's right. When we start getting into chapter 6, 7, and 8, we're going to see these terms sort of, whoa, sort of used interchangeably because they are talking about the same thing. They're talking about the old propensity, thank you, John, to sin. That doesn't go away just because we're saved. And that's the struggle that we have, is we're always fighting this old man. We're always fighting this, or woman. We're, <laughs> we're always fighting this old nature, this body of sin, this carnal man. We're always fighting him, fighting him, fighting him, fighting him all the time. These all reflect our inheritance from Adam. There we go. It's all Adam's fault. And, 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 Adam, and Adam got it from Eve, right? Uh, she, no, got, she was his helper. Yeah, okay, she, okay. There you go. Okay. That's right. And, and here's the problem that we have. As a result of Adam's sin, some things happen to us that we still residual, res, res, have residual of. Number one, man became dead to God when Adam sinned. That's a very difficult thing for some people to get their arms around. I was, I'm dead to God. Wait a minute. Oh, there are lots of God people out there. I mean, people all over the world worship things, right? They worship frogs. They worship snakes. They worship this. They worship that. They worship Buddha. They worship Allah. They worship all this stuff, right? How can we be dead to God? Well, the problem is we're all worshiping the wrong things most of the time. But God says in Romans 5, 12, that when Adam sinned, man became dead to God. We lost our ability to have fellowship with him. Remember when Adam sinned in the garden? What did he do? First thing he did. He, he ran from God? He ran from God. That's right. He went and hid himself. He covered his nakedness. Because he became dead to God. In his mind, emotions, and will, he no longer had fellowship and a relationship with God. Man became an enemy and alienated from God. Colossians 1.21. It's not that God considers man an enemy. It's that human race considers God an enemy. The true God. The real God. The God of creation. Man has a natural propensity toward not wanting to be around the living and true God. And in Romans 8, 7, man became a hater of God. We're going to see that. The true God. Not God little g, but God big g. You know, it's interesting when you look out at the world and you see, you can pretty much talk about any religion in the world. You could talk about Buddha. You could talk about Muhammad, Allah. You could talk about all the Hindu gods with their elephants and 15 arms and all of that. You bring up Jesus, all different ballgame. Even in our schools today, you can do, you can do um, assignments, book reports, anything you know, anything religious you want. Uh, one girl brought a book report on. They were supposed to do their favorite book, so she did a book report on her favorite book, the Bible. She got up and began reading her book report, and the teacher told her to sit down. She can't talk about that in school. But Ramadan, you could talk about anything else, and but you can't talk about that. Why is that? Man became a hater of God. And in our mind and in our emotions and in our will, we completely became corrupted by Adam's sin. And that corruption stays with us even after we're saved. And that's why we have such a struggle. That's why we have such a fight on our hands every day to do the right things. Maybe this morning you had a problem. Maybe you argued with your wife. Maybe you argued with your husband. Maybe you had a bad attitude. Maybe because you were late. Who knows? Did we get an argument today? Huh? Not today. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> well, good. And as a result of sin, our natural mind, the mind that we were born with, became incapable of knowing and loving God. That was one of the problems with Adam's sin. That's why he hid. 
it's marked by darkness and blindness. It's incapable of receiving divine revelation, and it's at war with God. What a terrible place to be. But that's where we all were and still are in our old nature, in our flesh. That's why we're capable of doing such mean, rotten things. At least I am. I think Ray might be. <laughs> Just mean, rotten stuff that comes out of our mouth, you know, sometimes. Incapable of receiving divine revelation. That's an interesting place to be. You know, our natural mind, the mind we inherited from Adam, we can't understand God can't understand what God is doing, what he wants. It's just impossible because we have no capacity. 1 Corinthians 2.14. And Romans 8, 7, and 8 tells us that we're at war with God. We're at war with him. He's not at war with us. And as a result, our natural heart became incapable of loving God. Now, we're all talking about the natural man, the man that we were before we're saved, the man that we carried with, with us. When I say man, I'm using it in a generic sense carry with us into our new relationship with God. We still have that old residual man. Dark, lustful, vile, hard, unrepentant, deceitful, desperately wicked. A slave to sin. We made choices under satanic direction in bondage to fleshly desires. The natural condition of our lives is called all of these things. And guess what? They're still there. They're still in you. And in me. They don't go away just because you became a Christian. And I think you probably can relate to some of these things. I know I can. Because that's where we all are. That's the problem Paul was describing. All of these bad stuff that keeps coming up when I want to do the right thing. I'm battling with this old nature. I'm always in you know, a struggle. Now here's the beautiful part. Wonderful part glorious part. When we were born again by the Spirit of God and made new, God gave us a brand new nature. Gave us a brand new capacity to know and understand God. Gave us a brand new mind, a brand new set of motions, brand new will. He gave us a completely Beautiful makeover. We talked about this in an earlier lesson. God made us an extreme makeover. He gave us a brand new nature. But when the kindness, this is Titus 3, 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit. He made us new creatures in Christ. Gave us a brand new ability to have a capacity for fellowshipping with God, for understanding God. And I don't know if you ever had this occasion where things that you used to think about and read about in the Bible before you got saved, all of a sudden you got saved and it started making sense. It's like, wow, how come I never saw that before? Things that God had done for you. Just all of a sudden, a whole new world of understanding opened up for you. That's because we were recreated, recreated in God's image once again. When Adam fell and sinned in the Garden of Eden, he lost a lot. Even though he was created in the image of God, that image was marred by sin. Well, God recreates in us a brand new capacity, a new image. Look at Colossians 3.10. It says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, creating a brand new capacity to know God. And it's recreating that image. We were created in the image of God. Adam sinned and marred that image. And God creates in us a brand new capacity, a brand new image recreates us in the image of God. He doesn't remake the old stuff. He gives you a brand new capacity. That's why the Bible says when you anyone in Christ, you're a new creation. A new creation. Brand new. Not a makeover like, you know, you take something and just kind of paint, paint it. 
put lipstick on the pig. You don't do that. It makes you a brand new creature. In seminary missions class, Herbert Jackson told a story as a new missionary. He was signed a car that would not start without a push. He said after pondering his problem, he devised a plan. He went to the school near his home, got permission to take some children out of class, and had them push his car off every morning. <laughs> as he made his rounds, he would either park on a hill or leave the engine running, and he used this ingenious procedure for two years. Ill health forced the Jackson family to leave, and a new missionary came to that station. So get the picture, this missionary had a car, and this car wouldn't start. And so what he would do is every morning he would have a bunch of kids come out and help him push the car to get it started, and then he'd park it on a hill or leave it running so that he wouldn't have to start it. He would just, um, or he wouldn't have to turn the key to start it. He could push it. You have a car like that? <laughs> well, when Jackson started to explain his situation to the new missionary that had arrived, the missionary says, well, I think I know your problem. <laughs> And they said, before the explanation was complete, missionary interrupted, why, Dr. Jackson, I believe your only trouble is a loose cable. So he went out and he jiggled the cable on the battery and hooked it up. And sure enough, all that needless trouble for two years that had become routine was simply he wasn't connected to the power. And this story is an illustration of our problem. And the problem is this. The problem is we have this old nature. We inherit it from Adam. The old man, the body of sin. You know, it's corrupt, it's dark, it's vile. It causes us to do, um, leads us into a whole bad realm if we let it. And we try and overcome it in our own power. We try and overcome it in our own strength, and we fail every time. It was kind of like this missionary trying to push his car to get it started when the whole time it was that he had power to get it started. He just didn't know how to use the power. Same with us. We have power that is at our disposal to help us live for God and has nothing to do with doing um, the right thing in our own strength because you'll never completely succeed at that. In order to have power to live for God, there is something we need to know. Now, here is when we get into chapter 6 of Romans. Paul's going to describe to us how to overcome the problem that we've just described. The problem is we have an old nature that doesn't let us do the right thing. We want to do the right thing because we're believers in Christ. We have the power to do it, but we're not accessing the power because we're going about it all wrong. There's a little engine that thought it could, I think I can, you know, and push to the top of the summit, which is. God's righteous standards. We don't make it. So let's turn to Romans chapter 6 in your Bibles. Take a look at these verses that are very important. Where's my blue letter Bible? Blue letter Bible. Okay. So we're looking at chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Paul starts off chapter 6. That's probably small, huh? Let's get the font bigger. There's the font. Disappeared on me. Disappeared. Yeah. Oh, here it is. There. Font size. Bigger, 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 biggest. There we go. Yeah, that is better. Okay, so here's what Paul says. What shall we say then? 
Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I'd like to just change that a little bit and say, suggest what Paul is saying here is that am I just supposed to accept the fact that I can't live for God the way I want to live for God, the way God expects me to live for God? I just can't do it. I'm too weak. I don't have enough strength. I don't have enough knowledge or whatever it is. I keep sinning. I keep failing. I'm miserable about it. I guess I'll just have to accept it. God's grace will just be sufficient to cover all the bad stuff I do. No. Then it says, no. Yeah. Go to the scriptures. He tells us it. Yeah, says it in the next verse, doesn't he? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Oh, wait a minute. Paul, I just thought you said that we have sin living in us. How is it I'm dead to sin? What does that mean? Anybody have any thoughts on that? What, how are we dead to sin? Dana says she has the answer. Well, no. <laughs> I know. By forgiveness. By forgiveness? We're okay. no longer slaves to sin. We have been forgiven. We have been given a new nature. Okay. We have been given a new okay. Okay. We've been given a new nature. We're no longer slaves to sin. And that's the important part. We've been forgiven. We're no longer slaves to sin. See, before you got saved, you didn't have any choice. You had to sin because that's all you did. All you knew how to do. Even though you didn't think you knew how, we're sinning all the time, guess what? If you're not saved, you're living in a, a state of sin. It's going to lead to eternal damnation, unfortunately. Once you get saved, once you're forgiven, you're no longer a slave to sin. For the first time in your life, you have a choice. You see, because when you were born again, this bond has been broken. Okay? You're no longer captivated by your sin nature. You're no longer required to obey its lust. You have a choice. For the first time in your life, you can choose the right thing. I finally have a choice. I finally know. have a choice. Did not have a choice before. And if God says it, and I can do it, I can be empowered to do it. Because His word is true and healing. There you go. And so I got to hold Him here. So the so first I thing, the first thing that happens is you've got to realize you are not bondaged to sin nature. You don't have to sin. You don't have to. It's like, whoa, why do I sin then? That's a whole other story we're going to get into. But you don't have to. God says we are dead. Or better, we have died to sin. When did we die to sin? At the point of salvation. When Christ died. When Christ died on the cross... He died for you and for me. And that doesn't just mean died so that we could be forgiven. That means he died because he broke the bondage of sin and the power of sin over us. We now have a choice. Know ye not that, that, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should be walking in newness of life. Now, I'm not going to get into the discussion of whether baptism here is talking about physical baptism. Some people believe this is talking about physical baptism. I don't think so. I think what he's talking about here is spiritual baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit that identifies us with Christ. But regardless of whether it's water baptism or spirit baptism, look at the effect. The effect is we were buried with Christ when he died. Who's we? This old man, this old nature, this flesh, this carnal man, this power of sin over us. It was crucified with Christ. That's why Paul said in another scripture, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Well, what was crucified? Our old man, our old nature, that sin in us. 
and it was buried with him. And just like Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. See, Paul's saying you have a choice. That's what he's saying here. And it's because Christ crucified our old nature. I don't know how he did that. I can't sit here and explain the process to you other than to say God says you need to recognize that when Christ died on the cross, sin's power over you was broken. So that if you sin today, you go out and do something really stupid you got nobody to blame but yourself. You chose to do it. You didn't have to. That's a pretty big revelation. You know how Flippy Wilson used to say, devil made me do it. Devil made me do it. <laughs> you can't say that. I wasn't breastfed as a kid. That's why I'm so messed up. Can't say that. <laughs> Not my fault. The woman made me do it. Can't say that. Today, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have to accept the fact that Christ put that old nature to death. You do not have to obey its lusts. You can walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, so shall we be also in the likeness of his resurrection. This, knowing this, that the old man, remember we talked about this, the old man, the flesh, the sin nature, the carnal man, all the same thing. That old man, is crucified with Christ. That the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Wonderful, wonderful truth that God is explaining and, and sharing with his here. You have the power not to sin. You have the choice not to sin. You have the ability not to sin if you wanted to. That's pretty amazing, wouldn't you think? A lot of responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're. No, ja Jackie says, well, that gives you a lot of responsibility. You know what you just said? I'm the little train. I'm got to try, really. I, that, that hill is really way up. i got to really got to get there, and it's a big job to do it. It's a lot of responsibility. No, it's not. See, what we're going to get into, that's the pitfall, is that oh, that's a big responsibility. I've got to live for God. I've got to make all the right choices. I've got to try really hard to do the right thing. And guess what happens when you take that road? You end up right back where you started falling on your face, wondering why you did the things that you did. Woe is me. Kick yourself in the butt. I quit. I'm not even going to try anymore. It's just too darn hard. Well, that's exactly where we don't want to be. That's exactly what God has freed us from having to do. We're going to see that. So, in order to have power to live for God, there's something we need to know. It's that we were baptized by one spirit into one body and we were given all one spirit to drink. Not only did our old nature get crucified on the cross with Jesus Christ, God has now given us a resource. The Holy Spirit. So that it's not our responsibility to live the Christian life. It's our choice to allow God to live it through us. It's not our job to live for God. Now that may seem like a, 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 a blasphemous statement I guess maybe. But it's not our responsibility to live for God. That's what you were saying. It's our responsibility. We got to live for God. It's such a big deal. It's not our responsibility to live for God in the sense that we don't have to do it alone. It, it's not up to us to do A, B, C, D, E, and God loves us. Living for God is on an entirely different plane. This may sound really strange, but it's true. We were baptized into Christ, which means our old nature was crucified on the cross. The Holy Spirit now has given us a brand new capacity to know and understand and love God. 
and the Spirit of God now lives in us. Why do you think the Spirit of God lives in us? What benefit is there for having the Spirit of God live in us? Just a general question, no right or wrong answer. Your understanding. What is your understanding? Why did God give us the Holy Spirit? Why does he live in us? Because we need him. Because we need him? Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel? We no longer have to do it alone. I don't have to do it. Okay, so yes, he's... Whatever is good, whatever is pure, think on these things. It's Philippians. What? He says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I will give you rest. But why did he give you this? Why is the Spirit living in you? Okay, and you said it at first. It's like, he's with us? Conviction. He what? Okay. Holy Spirit convicts us when we're doing wrong. That's a ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. He strengthens us. He gives us spiritual strength. Okay. He comforts us. He's there to comfort us. Jesus said, I go away, but I'm going to send a comforter. So he's going to be with you just like I was with you. Even more so, because he's going to be with you all the time. Sometimes I had to leave and go pray. Sometimes I had to go into another town. Holy Spirit's going to be with you all the time. So you're never alone. You're never alone. Even when you're alone. That's right. Even when you're alone, you're with God. Well, that's a compass. He leads us. He guides us. He said, "Oh, don't go there. Go over here." I remember the first time I got I got saved. I was um, looking for a church. I was probably saved maybe a week, and I was like, "Yeah, you know, I better find a church because I think that's what Christians do. They go to church." So I'm driving, to, you know, I'm in my bicycle. That's, that's how young Christians think. Oh, what do I do? So I'm on my, on my bicycle, and I'm riding to, to this college. I, I got saved when I was like 21. And I went by this church. It was a big, beautiful church, you know, big brick building. It looked really nice. And I was like, eh, it looks like what a church should look like. There's eh, some teenagers playing in the, um, in the parking lot. And I went in there, and I said, hey. I am looking for a church. I just got saved, and I need a church to go to. Is this a good church? And one of the ladies, one of the girls in the, they were playing basketball or something. She goes, yeah, yeah, that's a great church. As soon as she said that, I had this big whoomph from God, you know, boom. It was like, do not go there. And I'm like, whoa. I mean, it was like such a, 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 a massive thing, you know. I was like, whoa. I was almost, I was almost audible. I could almost hear it, you know. Do not go there. Stay away from this place. Whoa. And I'm backing away, and I look up, and it says, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm like, whoa, that was weird. Never heard of that before. Didn't know what Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was. It was a Mormon church. But the Spirit of God hit me so hard that to this day I still remember the feeling I had. That was the leading of the Holy Spirit, saying, that is not where I am. Do not go there. I finally ended up in a wonderful church. But I felt that. He leads us. He tells us things. Don't do that. Do that. We have to listen. That's the hard part. <laughs> That's the hard part. You're like, send me a sign. Yeah. Really did. We did work <laughs> But the most important thing, I shouldn't say the most important thing, one of the most important ministries of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and very few people really get their arms around this, is he's given to us to give us the power we need to do the right thing. We're going to see that even though sin's grip on us has been broken on the cross, we no longer have to obey sin. We still do because in our own flesh, we cannot overcome our sin nature. Just because you want to do what's right doesn't mean you will do what's right. And left to your own devices, you won't do what's right because your sin nature is stronger than your desire to do good. That's what Paul was describing when he said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Are you leaving us? Did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> I know. The most important thing. Bye, Jackie. One of the most important things that the Spirit of God does for us is he gives us the power to do what's right.
He gives us the power to do the right thing. We no longer have to be the little train that could chugging up the hill. I think I can. I think I can. And I never quite get to the top because guess what? I can't. <laughs> I think I can, but I never do. I don't get it. It's the Holy Spirit that picks you up off the track, takes you to the top of the hill. Let go, let God, and let's stop there. <laughs> so we set the stage here. All right, now I know where, where we're at. How do I get to the top of the hill? If it's not me in my own power. How do I get there? How do I have victory? What? Victory in Jesus. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we sing. Oh, yeah, we praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. And then we go out and then we just fall on our face. How can we live on that mountaintop? We can. How can we live in victory? We can. How can we live? Rejoicing all the time and understanding and un knowing the blessings. We can. We can get there. But it takes a whole new way of thinking about li Christian living. Get away from the rules. Get away from the do's and don'ts. We're going to look at a completely different way, biblical way, scriptural way, right way of actually living the Christian life. And that's exciting. Okay, let's pray.